So I want to thank everybody for attending today. Uh, my name is Emily Newman, and I am the Education Coordinator of the American Humanist Association. This is our September um, event for the Speaking of Humanism series, but also a special one because we've partnered with the uh, Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard to present their Humanist of the Year Award. And I'm um, going to uh, remind folks that along with the award ceremony, this is also a fundraiser. So you can go to AmericanHumanist.org slash donate Harvard. We'll have more on that for you later. And then uh, if you'd like to ask a question later on in the event, you can do so by typing a comment on uh, Facebook or putting it in Zoom in the Q&A function. So thank you again for joining us. And uh, we're going to have Greg Epstein, who is the Humanist Chaplain of Harvard at MIT, your MC today. Thank you, Emily. Um, it's really, this is, this is an honor um, to be emceeing an event like this. Honestly, this is a um, really significant event for me personally and on behalf of our organization, uh, the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard, which is an independent nonprofit, as well as the chapter of the American Humanist Association, uh, on behalf of our board of directors and our students and the, the faculty that support us and um, all the thousands of alumni that have been part of our community over uh, about 40 years since uh, we became the first ever humanist chaplaincy at a university or college in the world. Um, a chaplaincy, meaning a sort of form of support officially recognized by the university, um, tr you know, with a professionally trained chaplain who is sort of an advisor for humanists, atheists, agnostics, the non-religious, um, other religiously unaffiliated people. Uh, that's who we are, and, and we every year gather to present uh, in the fall sometime um, a, a Humanist of the Year Award, a Harvard Humanist of the Year Award. By the way, we're also at MIT now. We've been at Harvard for about 40 years. In the last couple of years, we've been at MIT, but this is a Harvard Humanist tradition that we're part of today. Um, and we're presenting our award, as you probably know very well already, to three truly inspiring artists, um, Ijeoma Olo'u, uh, Sikivu Hutchinson, and Mendisa Thomas. Uh, this award, uh, which was created more than 25 years ago now, so towards the beginning of our history as an organization, honors uh, individuals whose lives and contributions to society exemplify the values of humanism. Um, justice, equality, integrity, courage, community, uh, among others. And past uh, Harvard Humanist of the Year awardees have included uh, the filmmaker Seth MacFarlane, um, the writer, producer, director, Andrean of, of Cosmos fame, um, author and professor Anthony Penn, um, inequality critic and philanthropist Nick Hanauer, uh, human rights heroes General Romeo Dallaire and Taslima Nasreen, world-renowned scientist Ian Wilson, um, and, psycho and psychologist and pioneering former NBA basketball star John Amici, officer of the British Empire. Um, in such a tumultuous and distressing year, we felt that it was, it was really important to choose an awardee, or in this case, we, we allowed ourselves to choose three awardees um, who, whose leadership embodies the very best of humanism's potential to inspire social change. Um, I want to say just a bit more about that. Humanism from its beginnings has been um, at the very least aware um, uh, of systemic racism, um, systemic bigotry, but um, not as much as it should have been. Um, one of our honorees, uh, Sakibu Hutchinson, um, has done extraordinary work documenting and commenting on the treatment of Black women in society, uh, the marginalization, the dehumanization, the systemic oppression that uh, Black women have endured in this country for so long just because they're Black women in a racist and misogynistic society. Um, and so what I want to recognize today is that our movement um, 
the humanist movement is not above any of that, sadly. Um, you know, I, I'm somebody, I've dedicated my life and career to advancing humanism as an ideal, as a community, as a movement. And I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the work that I do. I'm proud of us. I'm proud of the community that, that the people on this uh, session, attending this session, represent. Um, but, you know, I also need to be honest about that just for myself, and I hope we will be. Um, the truth is that while organized humanism from its beginnings, um, you know, has at least been aware of racism, um, and against it in theory. What we've built in practice is a movement mostly of and for and by people of relative privilege. Um, people who, like me, have benefited from systemic racism and systemic inequality. And so you have a situation in which leaders like the three extraordinary individuals that we're going to honor today um, have, at least in my observation, probably had to work uh, doubly hard, um, be doubly effective, just to get to the point um, where they've been able to accomplish what they've accomplished, which is really quite remarkable. Um, and so I'm gonna introduce each of our three awardees briefly, um, in a moment, and then we'll really focus the discussion on just letting them speak. I, I just wanted to give this little kind of introduction from our organization so you could understand what it really means to us um, to present an award like this. Um, with that said, um, the award that you each have received um, is, um, is engraved with, um, with a quote from Zora Neale Hurston. Um, I accept the means at my disposal for working out my destiny. Uh, it seems to me that I've been given a mind and willpower for that very purpose. Uh, Zora Neale Hurston from Religion in, in Dust Tracks on a Road. Um, and uh, that, that quote was suggested by uh, Tony Pinn, um, Dr. Anthony Pinn, who um, was the 2006 Harvard Humanist of the Year. Um, so, uh, with that said, um, Mandisa Thomas, um, founder and president of Black Nonbelievers, um, you have, you've really had this incredible history uh, in the last few years that you've built up of um, becoming, um, at least in this country, probably the most, um, the most successful, the most um, engaging and, and, and iconic um, organizer of communities of black humanists and free thinkers and skeptics and atheists and agnostics, um, people who are doing fellowship and community. Um, and um, you know, you're a board member of the American Humanist Association. You've won numerous awards. Um, already for this work within the, the humanist and secular community. Um, but uh, I'm just really honored by the chance to have our organization shine its spotlight on you and, um, and recognize the fact that, that your work is just ever growing. I mean, we were talking just a second ago about how maybe the, the two biggest events you've ever done have come in just the last few months. Um, and really the best is yet to come. And so um, your willingness to be part of this conversation uh, means so much. And, and would you please um, share some remarks with us? Thank you very much, Greg. And thank you to uh, the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard and the American Humanist Association. I would have read the Zora Neale quote, uh, Zora Neale Hurston quote, by the way, just FYI. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> I, I zoomed. No problem. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for this award. And I am honored to receive this along with Sakibu and Ijoma. I've always said that I didn't get involved for recognition, but it is nice when it comes. It is important to note that Harvard University, while being a prestigious institution that directly benefited from slave labor, also educated some of the most iconic Black free thought minds 
including W.E.B. Du Bois and Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the father of Black history, and hosted civil rights leader Malcolm X, who hadn't been formally educated past the eighth grade, but whose intellect and wit far surpassed many PhDs of his day. In 2017, while tabling at the annual Secular Student Alliances Conference at The Ohio State University, I was approached by a Black woman and her daughter who were passing through. Upon asking about my organization and hearing my explanation, the daughter, the mom, turned to her daughter and said, well, she sounds just like you. After giving the young lady a high five, her mom and I then talked about how she and her husband raised their daughter to have an open mind, and that she also had questions about Christianity, the religion in which she was raised in, and how difficult it was to discuss with her spouse and other family members. It was in that moment after reassuring that we are supportive of both her and her daughter, that I in turn was reassured by our existence. Because it is highly likely that had she not seen an organization called Black Nonbelievers represented by a Black woman, that they may have walked past the event without a second look. I wish I could say the same for most of our engagement. In 2015, while exhibiting at the Atheist Alliance of America's conference in Atlanta, some of you may know about this, I was accosted by a Black Christian woman who angrily stated that I had the nerve to identify as an atheist as another Black woman in front of white devils. She also ranted that she was going to bathe me in the blood of Jesus, that she felt sorry for my mother and my children, and that I had a slave mentality. Such irony in those statements. But sadly, that mindset is still extremely prevalent regarding atheism within the Black community. I consider myself to have privilege, certainly not the economic or formally educated kind, hailing from New York City and being raised in the South Jamaica houses, i.e. 40 projects in Queens, I was that statistical disadvantaged Black kid that many in elite circles and beyond speak of. Although I am a graduate of the LaGuardia High School of Music and Arts in Manhattan. And I was raised to know and love the rich legacy of activism, creativity, intellect, and resilience that is the Black community, despite all the atrocities committed against us. I draw my strength from all of this, as well as having a strong secular influence in my maternal grandmother, Ethel May Welch. I recall many family celebrations and holiday observations with absolutely no prayer or observance of a deity in any way. I realize that my experience is rare, so I am indeed privileged. And it is through this privilege that I have now dedicated my life to advocacy, representation, and support for many Black atheists, humanists, free thinkers, and religion doubters, as well as the secular community at large. Contrary to the earlier inference by the Christian woman a few years ago and some others, there is nothing right about my atheism and humanism. My perspective comes from realizing that no gods, spirits, or supernatural beings exist outside of the human imagination. And my unapologetic blackness also could not allow me to accept that an all-knowing, all-loving God would subject my ancestors to such atrocities just to turn around and attribute their liberation to it. Religion and many God concepts, while certainly not the only causes of conflict of, and oppression in the world, has been a driving force behind many of them. And while we can acknowledge the role that the church has played in supporting many, I contend that the ultimate con game has been played on us. I am not the first person of color to express the sentiment, and with the rising number of religious nuns, I will not be the last. And as more make themselves known, it is important that our communities understand and incorporate Black secular history, our present, and our future. As many of you may know, it isn't easy cultivating community, especially from the ground up. And this has certainly been the case for Black nonbelievers. I can recall many instances of being undermined based on being Black and a woman and seeing more value placed on the work of those who are male and, moreover, white, by humanists from all ethnic backgrounds and gender identities. 
There are also the people who've sought only to build themselves while having us foot the bill. Take a time to reflect on that for a moment. For those of you who do not think that they have been affected by white supremacy, you may want to think about it. We all have. But we as Black women often bear the brunt of the institutional factors of having to work harder with less resources, and all with unrealistic expectations that cause many Black organizations and initiatives to falter. It can be daunting at times and leave you wondering at times if all of this is even worth it. Hey, I must keep it real here. But even through all of the trials and tribulations, I know I made the right decision. I am an organizer and a rather good one at that. And through this movement, I have formed unbreakable bonds with humanists from all ethnic backgrounds and gender identities. From the women I now consider my sisters, especially Bria Crutchfield, Sharon Paget, Sakibu, and to some of our dedicated organizers like Tina Marshall in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Roger in Washington, DC, to Black secular authors and film creators like Candace Gorham and Jeremiah Kamara, to many of my fellow secular leaders and organizers, and those who are now our ardent supporters. I feel like I have gained new family. It has been through resilience and strength that Black nonbelievers has withstood the test of time. Through our many events, our initiatives like our new True, True Liberation Billboard campaign, our collaborations, especially the 2019 Women of Color Beyond Belief Conference with Black Skeptics in the Women's Leadership Project, and the new Zora Neale Hurston Scholarship with the Secular Student Alliance, and support for individuals, we have created a special foundation and elevated the presence and voices of more Black atheists, humanists, free thinkers, and those questioning their beliefs. We have helped our members find new friends and family where there was either little to none left after leaving church and God behind. Some have even found the special loves of their lives. There has been inner strength discovered in themselves, something that religious belief tends to crush. And even in our fights against inst institutional oppression, we have the right as individuals to self-improvement and basking being free and simply to just be. But don't just take my word for it. Allow me to share testimony from our ongoing Be and Changes Lives campaign. Most days I want to die. I've struggled with suicide and self-worth and low self-worth for most of my life. One day I got up the courage to tell my dad about the first man to touch me. The next day I watched him shake that man's hand in church. Every pain I've had to pray away with no relief. My father, his mother, his brother and both sisters are ministers. I've always been different and searched relentlessly for people who look and felt like me. Then I found BN. I love how inclusive you are. You let people discover themselves and encourage us on this journey to be free of religion, AKA bondage. The connections alone are worth being a part of your organization. Never go away, please. And as another member so succinctly stated, the value of being cannot some be summed up simply or aggregated to a tidy number that will fit everyone because it is invaluable. We are your neighbors, your coworkers, and your friends and family. We are here. Black nonbelievers has indeed changed lives. So in conclusion, I would like to say that it makes a difference when, when more women, Black women, and especially Black openly identified atheist, humanist, and secular women are leading the charge. This is your chance to join the American Humanist Association, the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard, and others in supporting the work that we started doing. The work that we weren't going to wait to be done. The work which ultimately enhances the legacy of our ancestors and our communities. And as the calls for as the calls continue to for the end to racism, white supremacy, and the institutions in which they have thrived, we must also include a critical examination of not only religion and its effect, but also how sufficient is the support for Black women and our organizations and resources. As a community, we aren't separate from each other. 
We are working together. And we must continue to do so with honesty and flexibility and understanding for, about what may not be known, but what can be learned and contributed. There are no gods that will get us through this. We've already come to that conclusion. What's important now is doing what human hands and minds have always done. Tear down what other human hands and minds have created in the interest of greed, oppression, and complete self-interest and rebuild so that there is more equity, justice, and freedom for all. Thank you once again for this honor. Um, thank you so much, Mendisa. One of the things that I really, really miss in this uh, Zoom and coronavirus era is applause. Um, I would love for you to be hearing people's applause right now, as I think that, that everybody that is hearing this live and everybody that's going to hear it, um, I, I, I would imagine would applaud your work so um, vigorously. And um, um, presenting our award uh, to uh, Sakibu Hutchinson. Um, uh, an author, playwright, filmmaker, um, activist, and so many other um, superlatives um, and descriptors that, that are important to me and, and probably to you. Um, I, I was just watching um, recently, uh, Sakibu, some of your work, um, your, your film series, Narcolepsy, Inc., and um, it, it reminded me personally of, of a little, you know, sort of I heard echoes of Toni Morrison, Ursula Le Guin, um, Alice Walker, Chekhov, Strindberg. Um, but your um, your nonfiction writing, your activism, um, the scholarships that you provide, which you know you may say a bit about today. Um, in total, to me, what I just want to say, and I, again, I, I, I'm just one person, but I, I'm here today to represent a, a community. Um, rather than having everybody speak today, I just wanna say you, you've been one of the most impactful humanist voices of the past generations already. And it, it strikes me that you're just, you know, to use a sports term, you know, you, if you would be just hitting your prime, you know, you'd be just, just hitting your stride right now. It, you're, you're, you've been so productive um, as a literary and intellectual an activist figure um, in just recent years. Uh, and um, I, I can't imagine what this humanist movement would be without you. I really, I, I don't know that I would wanna participate in it if it didn't have uh, at this point, the work that you've been doing in the last few years. And um, we, we desperately need the work that you're gonna go on to do. Um, so, um, yeah, just just big things yet to come, and um, and and real gratitude for your being part of this event, and with the hope that that our um, supporters will be your supporters. So um, thank you for accepting our award, and we'd love to hear from you. I had to unmute myself there. Thanks so much, Greg, for the intro. And I want to express my appreciation and gratitude for this award. And I'm particularly honored to be receiving it with these two phenomenal women, Ijeoma and Mandisa. Mandisa, of course, is a longtime collaborator and comrade in arms and in the trenches with Black skeptics and women of color beyond belief and Black non-believers. So very honored. Audre Lorde once said that Black and third world people are expected to educate white people as to our humanity. Women are expected to educate men. Lesbians and gay men are expected to educate the heterosexual world. The oppressors maintain their position and evade their responsibility for their own actions. And there is a constant drain of energy, which might be better used in redefining ourselves and devising realistic scenarios for altering the present and constructing the future." End quote. And so as an unapologetically Black feminist, humanist. As Lord says, I and my sister comrades are always in this righteous position of defining ourselves for ourselves in order not to be crunched into other people's fantasies and eaten alive. Back in 2012, for example, I wrote an article called Black Atheist Rising, 
on white supremacy in the new atheist movement. And it elicited a backlash, a furor from a cabal of white male atheists, surprise, surprise, who fired off an industry memo to their white male cronies complaining that I needed to be quote unquote checked. In response, I wrote a piece called The Uppity Negress and the OGs, or Original Gangsters, on the heels of giving a seminar on culturally relevant humanism at an AHA conference where liberal white participants got hot and bothered over the term dominant culture because they were shocked to learn that there was a label for their invisible privilege. Now, of course, anti-racism is a new flavor of the month for white BLM appropriating, do-rag wearing poster children. For nearly two decades, my work has centered on feminist culturally responsive teaching, mentoring, youth leadership training, and college readiness for black girls and youth of color impacted by the school to prison and sexual abuse to prison pipelines. And I'm indebted to my parents, Yvonne Divans Hutchinson, an award-winning English teacher and literature scholar, and my father, Earl Afari Hutchinson, a writer, activist, historian, who really provided a Black humanist ethos of social justice in the way my brother Fanon and I were raised in South LA. Leading this work in communities of color that are often erased from mainstream public policy discourse on sexual violence is at the core of my commitment to humanist critical consciousness. My humanist activism is inseparable from my identity as a Black feminist, an atheist, a writer, an educator, a sexual and intimate partner violence survivor, and a union shop steward. Shout out to SEIU Local 721. One who lives in segregated South LA neighborhoods that are routinely demonized as quote unquote dangerous and other. Communities that stand in stark opposition to a white Eurocentric humanist lens removed from the everyday material realities and conditions of our lives as we are engaged in progressive anti-capitalist, anti-racist feminist struggle. Prior to the pandemic, a big part of my students' work involved doing sexual violence and sexual harassment peer education in classrooms at their predominantly African-American and Latinx South LA high schools. And working with youth from all genders and sexualities, they broke down the complexities of misogynoir, which is anti-Black misogyny, rape culture, sexual violence, victim blaming, and toxic masculinity from their lived experiences. As queer, cis, and straight Black youth who are constantly ghettoized and told rape culture doesn't exist, this is difficult, courageous work for them to do. While the hashtag MeToo movement has brought widespread media focus on high-profile white women in the entertainment industry, despite having been spearheaded by Black feminist Tarana Burke, it is estimated that a majority of Black girls experience sexual abuse by age 18. This is an atrocity and a, quote, pandemic within a pandemic, to paraphrase my colleague and friend, Black lesbian feminist sexual prevention activist and abolitionist Aisha Simmons. It's a pandemic within a pandemic that has really been marginalized within global uprisings around state violence. As Aisha said recently in an interview with my students, all of ninth and 10th grade, if racism were eliminated today, we would still not be safe in our homes, nor will we be safe in our streets, in our schools, certainly not in our churches, in our workplaces, folks in places where we still face massive pushback, working to end rape culture in African-American communities. Before the pandemic, my students created this chart that outlined an average day, in their view, in the life of a Black girl student. And an average day in the life of a Black girl student looks like being fingered. It looks like being catcalled. It looks like being slut shamed. It looks like being demeaned as a bitch, hoe, thought, choked, grabbed, and adultified by teachers, administrators, and law enforcement. But when it comes to standing for Black girls, the community at large is MIA. 
when it comes to standing for black, queer, trans, and non-binary youth, the community is MIA. And despite queer youth of color having some of the highest rates of sexual violence, victimization, and criminalization in American schools, there is this MIA silence and erasure of their lived experiences. As Pride, the Women's March, and even BLM have been embraced by corporate America, fetishized as branding slash marketing moments, Black girls across sexuality still remain invisible in national discourse around state violence and domestic violence. And of course, we know that COVID has amplified this divide. We know that rates of sexual and domestic violence are off the chart, have skyrocketed under COVID as school shutdowns have effectively robbed Black youth of vital mental health resources and safe spaces that white privilege automatically grants white youth. And it's important to me to emphasize that the work that we're doing is not novel work. This is not new work. Our sexual violence prevention resistance draws from this long tradition of Black feminist human rights resistance that shaped the modern civil rights movement, but has been ignored and erased. We have to lift up and hold space for the fact that Rosa Parks was a lead investigator in the brutal white supremacist gang rape of Reese Taylor, a black woman and a mother in Alabama in 1944. And the work is not novel, but certainly when I was growing up, we were not educated about this history. There was no language or platform to address the everyday sexual terrorism that black and brown girls experience. There was no language and platform to talk about, to unpack the way that black women have long connected the sexual terrorism they experience working in private homes and public spaces with the fight for economic justice and self-determination. And drawing from this legacy, progressive Black atheists and humanists have always insisted that yes, humanist struggle is rooted in dismantling white supremacy, American apartheid, wealth divides, and educational inequity, making these intersectional connections. Because at the end of the day, it is a humanist crisis, as we have been saying ad nauseum, when only white youth have the right to go to schools free of policing, when only white youth gain equitable access to college opportunities, when only white youth grow up in communities where they can expect to live into adulthood. And this trauma of constant death, loss, and mourning shapes the lives of many of my students. Their oral and written stories are replete with it. When they speak of terrorism, it has always had an American face, first and foremost. When they speak of occupied territory, it is in reference to their own neighborhoods and schools. And when they talk about imperialism, it is merely the legacy of what the Black Panther Party identified in the 60s as the pillaging of Black and Brown communities as colonies, something that we are seeing writ large with the wholesale dispossession of African American homeowners in traditionally African American and Latinx neighborhoods. And so it's easier for many white non-believers to identify the tyranny of state violence and repression with those, quote, backwards theocratic regimes out there. It's easier for them to focus monomaniacally on organized religion while being so-called colorblind to institutional racism and having the privilege to go to a university like a Harvard or like a Yale or like even a, a Cal State Long Beach here in California where all of the instructors, the deans, most of the student body, and certainly most of the tenured faculty look like you. Where it's assumed that if you rise in computer science, engineering, or philosophy, it will be based solely on your individual merits, not the vast array of privileges and advantages that constitute what W.E.B. Du Bois termed the wages of whiteness. 
In 2013, when Black Skeptics awarded our first cohort of South LA youth of color with their first in the family humanist scholarships, the world was awaiting the verdict in the Trayvon Martin murder trial. Saluting our new scholars in 2014, we began the school year with a videotaped assault of a black girl in South Carolina by a school resource officer because she had the audacity, the unmitigated gall not to put up her cell phone. Six years later in 2020, our youth received their awards in the shadow of COVID racism and the global Black Lives Matter movement precipitated by the lynchings of Breonna Taylor in Kentucky, Dijon Kazee here in Los Angeles, Ahmed Arbery in Georgia, Tatiana Jefferson in Kentucky, Elijah McLean in Colorado, Daniel Prude in Rochester, New York, Tony McDade in Florida, and of course, George Floyd lynched in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And there are so many, so many other names that have not been said, even in the midst of this resurgent BLM movement. And some of our school students have more daily contact with the police than counselors. And our youth have been actively engaged in the defund the school police movement because this is what humanism means for black students in this moment. When I went to give public testimony back in June to the LAUSD school board, which is the second largest school district in the nation as part of the Students Deserve BLM LA Defund Coalition, I wanted to lift up Lord's caveat that we do not live single issue lives and so there is no, quote, single issue struggle. Even in so-called woke movement circles, Lord's caveat is hard to honor. For example, six years ago, one of my students was handcuffed for watching a fight after school at her high school. To repeat, she was handcuffed while watching the fight. She was not engaged in the fight, she was on the outskirts of the fight. And so after the incident, she bitterly joked that if I'd been a white girl, I would have been given Starbucks and some Uggs. In short, she would have been pampered, handled with kid gloves, and put on a pedestal, treated like a Miss Ann or a Karen. In 2012, 16 year old Kiara Wilmot was arrested and expelled from a high school in Florida simply for conducting a science experiment. In the same year, a six-year-old black girl was handcuffed and arrest, arrested by police at a Georgia elementary school after throwing a tantrum. Nationwide, black preschoolers represent 12% of the population, yet are a majority of preschool suspensions, while African-American youth with disabilities are overrepresented in youth that are suspended. And black girls represent 54% of all preschool girls who are suspended. An incident after incident, too numerous to count, this is how anti-Black misogyny works for Black girls nationwide, day in and day out, where African-American girls are six times more likely to be suspended and expelled than our non-Black girls, more likely to be imprisoned, more likely to be, again, adultified, as hypersexual, as more mature than their years, and hence, uncontrollable. Anti-Black misogyny demonizes Black girls as loud ghetto bitches who need to be policed and made respectable in order to conform with my white middle class heteronorms. Anti-Black misogyny looks like WLP students talking about the specific stress and trauma they experience being viewed as both criminal suspects and disposable sexual objects who are slut shamed, body shamed, inspected, ranked, rated, and broken down day in, day out by boys, by men, by law enforcement, by teachers and administrators. Since 2006, WLP has conducted surveys with straight, cis, and queer Black and Latinx girls in South LA high schools. And the majority consistently report that experiences with sexual harassment, sexual violence, and policing at school are leading sources of trauma. 
This for us is not a back burner concern or an afterthought. This is how normalized rape culture and trauma are institutionalized under the police state within a Trump DeVos theocratic context that is working to further militarize urban school campuses and ultimately privatize and destroy public education. And so again, speaking outside the bubble of white secular entitlement, I thank you for the award. I appreciate the recognition, but I also want to salute all of the BIPOC humanists who are living their humanism in the day-to-day, -day, in the material conditions of disenfranchisement that we are living in now. I want to give a special shout out to comrades and allies who have been amplifying Black humanist resistance, challenging white supremacy, and religious bias for years, often, as Mandisa alluded to, at great personal and professional risk. Comrades like my sisters, Mandisa, Bria Crutchfield, Von Hurt, Kamala Hayward wrote to me, and Heather Aubrey, as well as allies and comrades, Donald Wright, Dr. Tony Penn, Candace Gorham, Sharon Paget, Bakari Shabanu, and Mashariki Lawson of the Black Humanists and Nonbelievers of Sacramento, Deanna Adams, Debbie Goddard, Frank Anderson from Chicago, and a special thanks to my Black Skeptics LA comrades, Dee Frederick Sparks, Liz Ross, Tony Bell, and Darren Johnson, who have been unwavering in their support of our next generation leaders, activists, scholars, and intellectuals, freedom Friday fighting for Black humanist resistance. The young people that have gotten scholarships from BSLA, the young people that have been working tirelessly with the Women's Leadership Project in South LA high schools. I also, in conclusion, want to give a special shout out of thanks, appreciation, and love to my family, immediate family, my husband, Stephen Kelly, who's also a free thinker, and my 12-year-old, who's dancing in the background here, Jasmine Hutchinson Kelly, who is a free thinker and a humanist as well. We are all literally in the run-up to November 2020 in an all-out fight for our lives. Thank you so much for this. Hi, my name is Greg Epstein. I am the humanist chaplain at Harvard and MIT, and you are attending the, or you're watching the third uh, speech from the Harvard Humanist of the Year Awards uh, for 2020. Uh, we earlier this year had a wonderful um, presentation of Harvard Humanist of the Year Awards to um, Sakibu Hutchinson and Mandisa Thomas. And we were about to uh, give one of those same awards to um, the brilliant and inspiring Ijeoma Oluo. But uh, at that time, uh, in fact, just as the second of what were to be three speeches uh, was taking place and uh, Ijeoma uh, was about to be the third uh, of our speakers for that day, um, a fire broke out in her home and uh, essentially burned it to the ground. Um, it, it was one of the most shocking things that I've personally ever been a part of, and I, I can't imagine um, what this has been like for you, Ijoma, um, but um, you thought on your feet, you let us know during the event, we, we made the best of it at that time, um, but here we are, and you very, very generously agreed to come back and give some remarks um, about uh, you and your extraordinary work and humanism. Um, as part of receiving our award, and we're, we're so grateful for that. Um, and just want to say a little bit 
uh, about you. Um, one second. You are, sorry about that. Um, um, you are a Seattle based writer, speaker. You're the author of the recently number one New York Times best selling book, So You Want to Talk About Race, um, which was published a few years ago, but then earlier this summer of 2020 um, uh, became one of the most iconic books of this year. Um, uh, it had already been an incredibly successful and influential book, but um, after the murder of George, George Floyd, um, people started turning to you and your wisdom, your ideas uh, uh, in a massive way. Um, you've been named one of the Roots 100 Most Influential African Americans in 2017, uh, one of the most influential people in Seattle by Seattle Magazine, and winner of you are the winner of the 2018 Feminist Humanist Award by the American Humanist Association, which is co-sponsoring this presentation along with the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard. Um, your work focuses primarily on issues of race and identity, feminism, social and mental health, social justice, the arts, and um, personal essays. And your writing has been featured in the Washington Post, NBC News, Elle Magazine, Time, The Stranger, and The Guardian. And I'm actually particularly excited uh, for your book, Mediocre, The Dangerous Legacy of White Male America, uh, which comes out on December 1st, 2020. Um, and, you know, I don't know that I'm, uh, I identify as a mediocre white male in every way, but for in so many ways, I, I probably am exactly that. And, um, and I'm grateful for you and your voice and the work that you do. And, and you've made me personally um, a better person and a better humanist. And you're making the humanist movement a better movement um, with your presence and some of your thoughts maybe today. So thank you for joining us once again and um, congratulations on this award and um, we'd love to hear anything that you have in mind to share. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, and thanks to everyone for this award. Um, it is an, a real honor and it's nice to be able to, to come back and accept it. Um, you know, I guess what I wanna talk about a little bit is my relationship with humanism. You know, I've been a, an atheist my entire life. Um, probably, I think, you know, I've written about this. I was probably five or six um, when my mom sat me down to explain the story of Easter. And, and I was like, I, I don't know, that doesn't sound like a thing that really happened. And, and that was kind of where it grew from for me. But I had never identified as a humanist. And the reason why is because where humanism had been introduced to me time and time again, it was usually as a rebuttal. Um, I would talk about feminism. I would talk about, you know, race theory. I would talk about racial justice. And the response I would get often from white men was, I'm not a feminist, I'm a humanist. Or I'm not an anti-racist, I'm a humanist. And what it often was, was an excuse to not hear. It was an excuse to not do and to not engage. And so when I was first, um, you know, first noticed, received notice I was gonna get the um, Feminist Humanist Award, I thought for a minute I was being pranked, I really did. I was like, oh man, what are, what are white dudes trying to do to me right now? Uh, because I had had the consistent experience I had had with people who I had self-identified as humanists was, was negative. But when you look at what humanism is and the concept of doing good without God, this should be a wholly positive thing. And so what I would love to talk about is how important it is to make sure that no matter how we identify religiously, ethically, politically, that we identify as something and that that identity is based on our actual values and the actions we are willing to take out and not an identity based on what we are not. And I think that it is very easy in a world where 
quite often certain groups of faith have perpetrated widespread acts of violence and hatred and division and oppression um, to identify yourself as not that. And there is an inherent danger in that. One, because you need that to exist in order to exist yourself. And two, it is never an active identity. All you have to be is not that. You don't actually have to be something else. And it prevents us from finding opportunities within existing systems and structures and finding collaboration and from being able to identify our own culpability in oppressive systems. And so I think that it is vital that we have more conversations about what humanism means as an action, what it means on its own, what it would mean if we woke up tomorrow and there were no people, no religious people out there. What would it mean if organized religion fell away? What would humanism be then? Would it just cease to exist? Would it have no reason? I like to believe that it would, but it only will if we do the work. I live in Seattle, Washington. It's not an incredibly religious space, but I can tell you that the same bigotries, prejudices, and systemic issues that are often ascribed to more religious areas happen right here in a place where you are more likely to find groups of atheists and agnostics than just about anywhere else. But so long as your identity is not that, you can let harmful systems continue to grow in your name, provided that you always have something worse to point to. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in our communities. And for me, my atheism, the idea that this is all I have, that the people around me are all I have, that all I have is the legacy I leave for my children and my grandchildren, the impact I make on individuals right now is incredibly empowering and allows me to do my work with love. It allows me, it forces me to recognize the humanity of every person I interact with. It is important that I stay steeped in that, even as I am confronted with religious bigotry, even as I am confronted with oppressive systems that often do have deep roots in religion. It is important that I remember what I stand for and not just what I stand against. And I hope that we can do that, that we can build bridges where necessary, but that we are willing first to say, that we are responsible for what we perpetuate in society. We are responsible for harm that we participate in and harm done in our names. And that that is first and foremost where our work needs to be done. That we cannot do the work to counteract the harm being done in religious spaces if we cannot first address the harm that we are doing in our own. And the truth is, is that the world of humanism and organized atheism is rife with classism, ableism, racism, sexism, transmisogyny, and queerphobia. We have to do the work here. Otherwise, any solutions that we work toward will, will perpetrate the same bigotries that we currently have. I know we can, because the truth is, is that our belief system should be based on our ability to grow and find solutions within ourselves. And this means that we should not be bound by the bigotries we were raised in. We should not be bound by our ties to oppressive systems. We just have to know that we can do better. And I hope that we will. It is more important now than ever as we see extremism on the rise and we see the normalization of violence against vulnerable populations that we lean into our idea that we have what it takes within us to do good, that we have what it takes to fight for and create free systems that recognize the humanity of everyone. We have to do this work now. We have to be defined by action. Otherwise, no one else will. I believe in us, I believe in myself, and I hope that you will join me in this work this year and all the years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ijoma. Um, 
one of the things that I miss most during the pandemic is applause. <laughs> uh, you know, I get a chance through the work that I do to hear some um, really remarkable things said. Um, and that was um, one of those moments. And, and, and I, I wish that you could hear a few hundred humanists um, applauding those remarks. But, um, but in, in lieu of that, I would like to discuss them just a little bit with you. Um, it's interesting, You're, you received another award from the American Humanist Association, as I mentioned in, in introducing you a few years ago. Um, this award is, is from the Humanist Chaplaincy at Harvard. It's co-sponsored by the American Humanist Association, so you're, you're doubling up with, with, <laughs> with us with them. Um, but I'm struck by, the, by some, some differences along with similarities in, in the remarks that you've chosen to give today. Um, that, uh, that set of remarks back then was, it was, I would describe it as kind of an internal critique. Um, you know, you were, you were sort of generously willing to, to attend that event at that time, um, but you did it, um, I thought, in a really important and, and constructive way as a way of saying, listen, let's not let ourselves off the hook. This, this is a movement that, that really needs to look itself in the mirror and, and figure out why it isn't living up to its stated beliefs. Um, this, this time I, I heard you speaking almost like a humanist chaplain. Uh, you know, <laughs> forgive me for, for projecting that onto you. That's what I do for a living. Um, and I can only, you know, wish that, that what I did for a living was, was more like what you do. But, but you know, still, your, your focus on, um, on being our positive selves and, and adopting a positive identity, a positive set of values on, on, on focusing on what we are, not just what we're not, um, is something that, that I, I think about every day. And um, what, you know, what would humanism mean if, if religion fell away? Um, such an important point. And I, 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 I think it's a gift to our movement at this moment that you're sort of willing to um, encourage us to, to, to focus on that and, and, and dream about that possibility, you know, that, that, that we would have, not that religion is going to fall away, that's not the possibility that, we're, that I'm so much dreaming of, but, but that we'll have such a fully articulated uh, identity that it would be, you know, that we could be for ourselves what we would be in, in such a, you know, hypothetical situation. So my question for you is, you know, what, you know, what are some of the things that are coming to your mind these days that, that you'd like to see um, humanism be more of, to, to be that positive um, identity to, you know, what, 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 you know, when you dream about this stuff as, as a thinker that, that we all admire, that so many of us admire, you know, even if it's not fully conceived for you, what, what are some of the, the ideas that, that are coming to your mind that you'd like to see humanism become in the next year, in the next few years, in the next generation, um, if that's a, a fair question. Yeah, um, you know, I would love to see humanism be really a driver of thinking about new, equitable, just systems. I would love for us to think about what it means to not only divorce ourselves from religious dogma, but from social and political dogma as well and recognize that if we're going to break away from one powerful system, we, we should, we have it within us to break away from them all. So what does it look like to recognize that if, you know, I think a lot of times we forget that the earliest religion and still in many places around the world, religion was a political and economic structure. And this means that we can't break from faith and not break from capitalism and not break from you know, oppressive you know, government that doesn't represent us. And so what would it mean if we're going to make one big important break to break it all? What would it mean to actually reimagine something better? What would it mean to continuously investigate the way in which we try to investigate how religion has worked its way into our thought process, to, to investigate the way that racism and sexism and ableism and transmisogyny has worked its way into our thought processes. We, have, we know what those steps look like. We know what it looks like to create a space where we can remove a dogma. So why not remove them all? Why not you know, really dedicate to that work? Because if what we're fighting for, I, I believe personally for me as an atheist, it is not I am fighting for everyone to believe there is no God. 
right? I, 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 I care little in that sense. What I care about is undoing the harm that oppressive systems and structures and organizing, organized religion is, is the face of one of those, many. Um, then if that's what it is, our work is never completed just saying, I don't go to church anymore, or I made it a place where people don't have to go to church anymore, right? Um, if, if the harm that's been done in the name of religion can still be done in the name of atheism, then we're, we haven't undone the harm. And so that is where I think, you know, I would love to see where we take this skill, where we take the knowledge that we can step away from that. Because I have seen time and time again, how often, you know, as a, as a queer black woman atheist, how much many white men within atheist spaces cling to all of the other dogmas that form their identity except for religion yeah. and how threatened they are by, the, by someone coming up and telling them that they believe that they could do better. I firmly believe they can. I've seen what that growth process looks like. And so that's what I would, I would absolutely love to see. I would really love to see challenges to all of our systems. I think that one thing we have to remember is that if you are in any way a marginalized population or have built an identity where you think you're marginalized, and I would argue that many humanists are not nearly as marginalized as they think they are, um, that you easily, um, you think that the work of just existing is enough, you know, and, and it's easy to think that your definition of success is the ability to believe what you believe and have everything that the majority has. And I want us to question what it means um, to say, be a white male atheist and be able to walk amongst religious white men and feel comfortable and powerful. Is that success that we want, right? Um, it's not something that's open to me as a black woman. So it's not even a question I ask myself. Um, but I think that those are the sorts of things that we have to recognize. Um, are we fighting to have our place in an oppressive system or are we fighting for a new system? And, and I would say that because atheism, of course, cannot exist within Christianity or within organized religion, we already know we have to build at least one new system or we have built one new system. I think we need to recognize that we can't have equity within patriarchy, that we can't have, you know, um, we can't care for people within capitalism. Um, and, and, and we can be drivers of that change. And I hope that, that we decide to be. Yeah. It's really hard for a lot of humanists um, to, to sort of make that transition. Um, and there are reasons sociologically, the history of humanism um, is rife with reasons why it was an identity that um, white men were statistically more likely to adopt than other groups, than, than people in other groups. Um, and, you know, I, I, I do really believe that you are helping change that, but I also think that it is, it's a difficult job to, to change that. Um, and, and I've lived part of it because I, you know, I always thought of myself as, as extremely progressive and really didn't realize just how much um, I still needed to learn, still needed to understand. And I, I think I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. um, could you talk then about this new book uh, specifically, mm -hmm. because, you know, I will say, um, you know, this book, so you want to talk about race, um, you know, again, made a, a big impact, really affected a lot of conversations throughout our culture. I'm, I'm rooting for and very much expecting this next book um, to make a similar impact. And I'd like to hear from you in advance, um, you know, what kind of impact are you hoping to make uh, on, on national conversations by releasing such a book at such a time? And, 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 and you know, by extension, you know, how do you think that specific message um, should impact the humanist movement as well? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, so you want to talk about race as kind of like a workbook, right? It's a book that I'm hoping you can work through issues around racism with. Mediocre, dangerous legacy of white male America is a diagnostic. Um, 
where I think we are as far as recognizing the pervasiveness and the harm of the way in which we define success in this country and the way in which it's tied to white male supremacy is still pretty much at an infancy stage. And so this book is really about showing what it looks like, showing what we have chosen as a people and what we participate in, these harmful systems and the ways in which um, we define white male identity and define success and leadership in this country has harmed people of all races and ethnicities and all genders. Um, and so my goal is through story and through history to draw these lines, to draw these parallels so that people can see, oh wow, what's happening today, what we're seeing in our politics, what we're seeing in our streets is not new, it's not a, you know, a random phenomenon. Um, and also it's not something we can subscribe to one small group but this is our country and these are our values playing out. And so that we can start to recognize the need to choose something different. And I think that for the humanist, I think that anyone, my goal with this was for everyone to see these are our collective values. This is our collective mythology that we have to break from and that it lives in us and we carry it. And therefore we all need to make different choices. And I think that that is vital to humanism because humanism um, to be crude can get up its own ass a bit, right? It's very, um, we figured something out that no one else figured out. And I resemble that remark. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's vital to recognize, oh, you know, actually this is still a part of this broad system. And even the ways in which humanism can think that just divorcing from organized religion is something new and the ways in which it can often denigrate how women, people of color come together and create change, maybe even within religious spaces, um, is incredibly harmful. And so I, I hope that everyone, regardless of faith, can look at this and, and start looking for the ways in which they may be upholding some really harmful belief system, systems and, and perpetrating harmful actions and make different choices because that's the awareness has to come. And so this is, this is really a story of America. It's not a story of white men as much as it's a story of the way in which we uphold this idea of white men and form this identity around white men. And we are all in that story and there's very little religion. I mean, there is some, but there's very little religion in the book because when it comes down to it, um, your faith will not stop you from feeling threatened as a white man when you see people of color getting promotions around you at work, right? Um, yeah, like these, these structures are enduring because they're tied to an identity that's even deeper than faith. And I want us all to examine that because what I see more often than not is that religion is not the root of these, but religion is a very powerful proponent of oppressive systems. It carries oppressive systems, but they still exist. We still have to actually do the work of taking the systems apart. The last comment is sort of a, it's just a final compliment that I wanna offer, but I'll put it in the form of a question because um, by way of concluding, I'd, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well, uh, Ijeoma. And that's, that is, um, you know, you, you really, you've, you're a hero. You know, I, I don't know if that word is weird because it is, it is gendered or it isn't gendered, but you're an inspiration to a lot of people. Um, in fact, I was writing uh, about you for TechCrunch several months ago. Um, and uh, you know, did a kind of cover story or lead story about you and your work uh, there that I really enjoyed researching. And and um, you know, and I found myself writing, well, okay, you know, when 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 her legacy is defined, you know, who's to say that 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 you wouldn't be, you know, in that category of of great names of civil rights leaders and thinkers that we've thought of, like you know, in, in that Martin Luther King category. I'm not, you know, I don't want to put that pressure on you, but I'm just saying that, that you've, you've inspired a lot of people. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I'd like to think that there would be more young white men, straight white men, privileged white men, like me or young me out there, who would look at you and say, you know, there's a hero, there's an inspiration of mine, because thanks to you, they would say, I get to live a freer, healthier, 
you know, more emotionally whole life where I can be a broader range of things and I can express myself through compassion and through being part of justice rather than just sort of taking the path that, that would have been easiest for me. Um, what does that feel like for you though? I mean, you know, do, do you want that, that role in, in people's lives? You know, do, does, does it get projected onto you in, in weird ways? I mean, you know, getting awards like this, what, what does it end up meaning for you in terms of what you actually want your own role in, in society and culture and humanism to be? Oh man, you know, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a really, you know, I'm a weirdly private person in that I've always got something to say, but I also like, I kind of always, I don't want to be at the forefront of things. But what I've learned is that a black woman living as her whole self is first very threatening and then second, very liberating. And where that helps first and foremost, black women, other black people and other people of color, um, I revel in that. Um, absolutely love that. And when I hear it there, but also I do end up hearing from white men. Um, I love people and I believe in the potential of people. And I, I have no desire to have things named after me. I have no desire to like, you know, be famous um, in any way but I wanna help people. And right now my work connects with people and my life inspires people. And, and I do know, I think I would have been inspired by myself as a kid. Um, and I, I'm so grateful for the people who've inspired me um, and continue to inspire me. And so I just, I know I just have to keep doing the work. And I, and I, and I also, I live in this weird space of, it's weird. You know, it's weird to be, a, you know, I still think of, you know, an everyday person who gets these emails and these letters. Um, but also I, I have to respect um, people's journey and people's words. And so if my work brings people along their journey, I don't get to toss that out and say it's insignificant because their journey is important. And that's kind of the way I think about it. But I hope that my work will be measured in how people grow past it you know like i would love that I, I i would hate for my suggestions my recommendations to be on my deathbed of thing people are still striving for um i would like for it to be a footnote in history you know well before then maybe we could be reading your novels and and all sorts of <laughs> things that, that, that you know will be your next steps but but we'll we'll take this uh with gratitude for for now thank you so much um on behalf of uh, the American Humanist Association um, and uh, Emily Newman, who's been incredibly helpful um, at, at, in her work uh, on the AHA's educational um, outreach, um, and on behalf of the, the humanist community and, and chaplaincy at Harvard. Um, what, a, what an honor, um, especially under the circumstances, and we, we hope to see you again sometime when we can all see anyone at any time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, someday we someday. just get in there. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Take care and and thank you very much again. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Have a great day.